for behaviorology. To assist the criminal and civil justice systems. To improve our society. A podcast like no other. Here is your host, Timothy Joseph. Hello. Welcome to the new year here at Criminal Behaviorology, and I'm so glad you're with us. I'm going to talk tonight about an interview I did on the Anthony Burgess novel, A Clockwork Orange, and uh, it was a novel and a Stanley Kubrick movie. On the back of the book, it says, A Vicious 15-Year-Old Droog, D-R-O-O-G, is the central character of this 1963 classic. In Anthony Burgess's nightmare vision of the future, where criminals take over after dark, the story is told by the central character, Alex, who talks in a brutal, invented slang that brilliantly renders his and his friend's social pathology. A Clockwork Orange is a frightening fable about good and evil and the meaning of human freedom. And when the state undertakes to reform Alex to, quote, redeem him, the novel asks, at what cost? This edition includes the controversial last chapter, which is the first time I've read it. I read it in this book in a weekend, and that last chapter changes a lot. So the last chapter not published in the first edition And Burgess's introduction, A Clockwork Orange Resucked. So in that introduction, I'm going to read a little bit from that part. It says, Let us have evil prancing on the page, and up to this very last line, sneering in the face of all the inherited beliefs, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and Holy Roller about people being able to make themselves better. Such a book would be a sensational, and so it is. Such a book would be sensational, and so it is. But I do not think it is a fair picture of human life, Burgess writes. I do not think so, because by definition a human being is endowed with free will. He can use this to choose between good and evil. If he can only perform good or only perform evil, then he is a clockwork orange, meaning that he has the appearance of an organism lovely with color and juice, but is in fact only a clockwork toy to be wound up by God or the devil, or since this is increasingly replacing both, the almighty state. So I did the interview with... uh, pretty well-known behavior analyst, Bobby Newman. And he had written an article back in the 1990s about the Anthony Burgess story, A Clockwork Orange. So this was in Behavior and Social Issues, Fall, Winter, 1991, A Clockwork Orange, Burgess and Behavioral Interventions, Bobby Newman, which at that time, Department of Psychology, Queens College, City, University of New York. In the abstract description, it says, One of the more popular and negative images of behavioral interventions held by the lay public is that presented in Anthony Burgess' A Clockwork Orange. It is suggested that because this image is so popular, the book and its author must be understood by behavior analysts if they are to adequately respond to claims made in the book and subsequent movie. The book was originally published in the United States with only 20 chapters, the movie also ending with that 20th chapter. The 21st chapter, first published in the U.S. in 1986, changes the focus of the book from the morality of behavioral interventions per se to the more general issue of the existence of free will, and the state's destruction of same. Several of Burgess's works are examined. It is suggested that Burgess wrote his books from the standpoint of a Catholic with a belief in original sin and deity-granted free will. 
It is concluded that although Burgess raises an important concern, a clockwork orange fails to offer any real answers to the questions it poses. With regard to behavioral interventions, it is suggested that the conditioning Burgess describes would rapidly extinguish and that is, understanding of the philosophical and political ramifications of behaviorism is lacking, and he fails to acknowledge any good that can come from such interventions. So Bobby Newman and I discussed a lot of what you just heard there in the abstract, and a little bit about behavior analysis in general, the field, how it's perceived, and how we can do better. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information on Bobby Newman himself, there on uh, the ABAI website, Dr. Bobby Newman is a licensed psychologist and board-certified behavior analyst. He received his PhD from the City University of New York. He is the past president of the Association for Science in Autism Treatment, as well as the New York State Association for Behavior Analysis. His past books include The Reluctant Alliance, No Virtue in Accident, when Everybody Cares, Words from Those Who Care, Graduated Applied Behavior Analysis, Behavior Speak, I have that work, I have that book, and Behavior Ask. He has published numerous research articles on the analysis of verbal behavior, behavioral disorders, education and training, mental, uh, and the behavior analyst, and the psychological record, and behavior and social issues, and elsewhere. He has been honored by several parent and professional organizations for his work, including having an award named in his honor by uh, FEAT, F-E-A-T, of Central New York. He provides regular training and consultation to programs all over New York, as well as Ireland, Northern Ireland, England, and Canada. Bobby has written many articles on behavior analysis for popular magazines and been, has been the host of two radio call-in shows. Hmm. He's also a marathon runner and uh, has his own uh, team, ABA Charity, for a, uh, a uh, marathon run that he does. And I'm going to put that link in the description. So I'm going to go ahead and get with the interview with Bobby, and I hope you enjoy it. And go ahead and write to us on any of the podcasts or the social media sites or write to criminalbehaviorology at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or requests for transcripts. Hello, Dr. Newman. How are you? Oh, fine, thank you. Okay. Uh, how are you today? I'm doing okay. I've It's been a little bit of a busy day, but uh, uh, I think I'm hanging in there. Uh, how is the weather in the okay, state of New hear. York? Uh, it's getting a little colder now, and uh, we had a little precipitation today. Not uh, snowing, but a uh, uh, little wet out there. But so far, we haven't had too bad of a, uh, a winter. Uh, I lived in New York City for two years, and uh, I don't remember any. I think it snowed a couple of times, but that's the city. Um, depends on the on the year. There are some uh-huh. times when it... Uh, you know, really piles up everywhere, and, you know, it's impossible to get the cars out, and everything is buried, and sometimes we get lucky. Uh, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's really a crapshoot in terms of, uh, you know, what, what year, how much, uh, you know, what the levels are. Mm-hmm. So you have worked in the field of behavior analysis for many years now, and I looked up a little bio uh, of you on a couple different sites, so... You've published how many books? Uh, depending how you slice it in terms of editing and multi-authored and uh, things like that, it's about 13 at this point. Mm-hmm. I, I have your book, Behavior Speak. I found it to be very useful. Oh, thank you. That uh, is a fun one I put together with Ken Sharon Reeve and Carolyn Ryan. Uh, it really, I think, was answering a need at the time, and... I was surprised at how well that's uh, been received and still um, uh, a lot of people use it. Although I've got to be honest, I was also a little disappointed by some of the Amazon.com reviews because we tried to make it a bit humorous and tried to keep people interested. There were some people who thought we weren't taking it seriously, which uh, obviously was not the case. Uh, We all take the work extremely seriously. 
And then there was one or two reviews that were absolutely baffling. There were things like, uh, well, this book is just a dictionary. And I find myself thinking, okay, what part of the subtitle, a glossary of terms, didn't tip you off to that? But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just the nature of the game, unfortunately. We also had a very bad review on the Behavioral Detectives book, which is a um, sort of a staff training manual, staff training exercise book, I guess I should call it, where you read about a case and it didn't go very well in terms of a behavior management procedure, and then you turn to the back to find out what was fixed and how it went, kind of a tribute to my Encyclopedia Brown books from when I was a kid that I used to read. And uh, one of the very bad reviews on Amazon read that, uh, sure, and every time you turn to the back, it, you had to change the treatment plan. And I found myself thinking, well, that was the book, what the book was about was how and why and when to change treatment plans. What did you think it was going to be? So I guess I have not done the best job of, of letting people know what the book was actually supposed to be about. I guess you found out you can't please everyone, huh? Yeah, I think that's a very appropriate, very appropriate statement to what the Ricky Nelson uh, yeah. Garden Party song. Yeah. You can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. Uh, I think he was a very uh, yeah. wise songwriter, or whoever yeah. wrote that song. I think it was Ricky Nelson. Yeah, astute observation, yeah. Well, I I went looking around, and I, I found you had written an article in, in 1991, which uh, has been a while ago, but it was about something that I was interested in, the this book by Anthony Burgess, uh, A Clockwork Orange. And, uh, yes. Um, that movie has, that was a Stanley Kubrick movie that I think came out in the 70s sometime that I've, I've seen that before. And then I got, I've read the, I reread the book just this past weekend, which, um, we'll get into. But what, what drew your interest to the depiction of behavior analysis? in that story or in other stories that you uh, have come across? Well, it was a very early uh, experience for me. I started in the field in the 80s, which was a time when A Clockwork Orange was actually still in people's thoughts, both from the movie from the 70s and also to foreshadow something that we're going to be talking about. The full book wasn't published in the United States until 1985. Mm -hmm. The uh, earlier version of the book that had been out all those years and the Stanley Kubrick movie version ended with Chapter 20. Uh, there actually was a Chapter 21, mm -hmm. which was eventually published in the late 80s. And unfortunately, that image of a clockwork orange and behavioral uh, psychologists was one that was really in people's minds. Um, mm -hmm. I've always had an interest in what's known as utopian literature, and we can put dystopian literature in that genre as well. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, whenever people talked about Walden II, which was B.F. Skinner's utopia based on behavioral principles, somehow A Clockwork Orange wound up being discussed. People were bringing it up, and they would label the uh, psychologists in uh, Clockwork Orange as you know, white-jacketed B.F. Skinner's or, uh, you know, uh, ex extensions of B.F. Skinner. And, you know, they, again, they drew the very explicit parallels with A Clockwork Orange. So it was sort of important to me to understand what this novel was, since this was the image that many people had of behavior analysis, an extremely inaccurate image. But um, mm -hmm. it's important to know, uh, you know, go back to your Sun Tzu and the Art of War. If you know yourself, you'll win 50 out of 100 battles. If you know your adversary will know 50 out of 100 battles, you'll win 50 out of 100 battles. If you know your adversary and yourself, you will win 100 out of 100 battles. So it's important to know both sides. And the more I looked at A Clockwork Orange, the more I realized that Burgess's um, point was never to talk about behavior analysis or behaviorism in particular in A, in a Clockwork Orange. He did talk about it in other books and other uh, short stories and things. But in A Clockwork Orange, he had much bigger fish to fry, so to speak, in terms of um, more general philosophical concepts. But that comes out much more strongly if the 21st chapter is included with the book and with the movie. Mm -hmm. and, and among, uh, just as kind of an aside, among other movies that may have touched on the topic of behavior analysis, I only think of a few. Would you include The Manchurian Candidate, you know, that story? Yes. Um, um, anything that kind of became associated with manipulating behavior uh -huh. uh, somehow got inextricably tied 
um, things that actually had nothing to do with behavior analysis, like sleep teaching and subliminal advertising and mm -hmm. things like that. We find people like Aldous Huxley discussing these things in the same breath as behavior, uh, what they were calling behavior modification in those days. Um, so it all got tied up together in many people's popular imaginations, even though obviously behavior analysis has nothing to do with sleep teaching or subliminal advertising or other such uh, science fiction-y kind of concepts. Mm -hmm. And um, I can think of, uh, there was a, a horror movie, a, a, a George Romero, Day of the Dead, where it had a, a, a like a mad uh, behavioral scientist. He was trying to do... Uh, behavior analysis on the zombies to make them behave and i i thought that was kind of a amusing but yeah it's always a kind well, of a a deranged um, psychotic uh, scientist that's into behavior analysis doing these kinds of things i've uh, got to be honest i don't think i've ever seen that one yeah. so i'm gonna have to take your word for it <laughs> yeah so it's just yeah, I, I haven't seen a a positive image in film or literature that i that i know of up to this point maybe there is something out there so the, the basic plot then of Clockwork Orange is uh, the young man, it's a lot of uh, uh, the juvenile criminality and that they, uh, the, a very powerful state, it's set sometime in the near future, according to when the, the book came out, and they, they, they use a lot of aversive conditioning on this young man to uh, turn him into a, uh, a docile... Uh, non-criminal person. Is that, is that the basic plot of it? Yes, uh, that is. Basically what we have is Alex, that was the name of the protagonist, uh, mm -hmm. played very powerfully by Malcolm McDowell in the movie. Uh, he did an excellent job with what he was given. Mm -hmm. um, and the violence is extreme. And we're talking rape, murder. We're mm -hmm. talking, um, you know, extreme criminality. He and his friends. If you read the book, uh, a lot of it is sort of in slang. Um, mm -hmm. So his friends were droogs, the sort of Russified kind of English that they were using. And a tremendous amount of real serious aggression, real serious criminality. Uh, he goes to prison and he volunteers for this experimental program where they use something that looks like a classical conditioning kind of procedure to make him get extremely violently ill to the point where he's physically helpless when he even thinks about becoming aggressive. And then, you know, he's released, <clears throat> excuse me, back out into the world where this conditioning makes him, you know, helpless. He is then used politically by both sides. The government in question says, look, you know, in power, I should say, we're you know, keeping people from being violent, we're, we're, you know, changing that. But other people then turned around and said, you know, you've crossed the line here. This is, you know, has made him into, you know, a subhuman kind of person who's defenseless. And in the book, they actually reverse the conditioning. The book, and I believe the movie ends uh, with Alex pretty much observing, I was cured all right. And it was very... Um, clear that he was going to go back to his life of ultraviolence, as mm -hmm. it's described in the book. Um, in the 21st chapter that I made reference to, uh, which was not published in the United States or was not included in the movie uh, until much later, uh, it was never included, obviously, in the movie, but was included in the uh, 1985, I believe it was, publication of the book. Mm -hmm. In this chapter, Alex sort of freely decides to grow up. He is considering his life and he was a great fan of classical music, uh, particularly Ludwig von Beethoven, mm -hmm. and he realizes just what everybody else is, you know, what, uh, what Ludwig and uh, Mozart and other people had accomplished at their age and all he, at, at his age, and all he had ever done was extremely destructive, violent things. And he decides that he's going to grow up and become a more constructive member of society. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that really um, is a key to the whole thing because it transforms the book from an indictment of behavior modification into much more of a Catholic um, philosophy book. And that was Burgess's actual intent. If you read Burgess, uh, he was raised a Catholic, and two particular Catholic philosophers, Pelagius and Augustine, mm -hmm. who represent a more, you know, Augustine with his belief in original sin and humanity is uh, inherently fallen, and needs to be controlled and needs to um, you know, atone for this original sin. 
uh, versus Pelagius, who was a medieval monk who had a much happier and much more optimistic view of human nature and did not think that these kind of controls were necessary. And this distinction between the Augustinian and the Pelagian, which, again, is labeled by Burgess as such in other books, and he discusses it much more openly in terms of uh, his other philosophical kinds of works, mm -hmm. um, that's really what A Clockwork Orange was getting at. So the idea of the behavior modification was sort of people not seeing the forest for the trees. Everybody was so concerned about the behavior modification that they missed the greater uh, philosophical question here. Uh, and again, not having that 21st chapter in the book or the movie initially did not help with that. It took a little bit more reading and reading more of Burgess's other works for that to that point to truly come through. And give credit to Burgess, this was not something he came to lightly, as I understand it in some of the accounts that I read. His uh, wife, and who was pregnant at the time, was actually attacked and... Uh, either seriously injured or possibly even killed by uh, some street thugs. Mm -hmm. So somebody who suffered that kind of loss and or that kind of trauma to nonetheless, in one of his books, if I remember correctly, uh, the quote was something to the effect of, it would be better to have our streets infested with murderous hoodlums than to deny individual freedom of choice. Um, yeah. The fact that he had been a victim of this, you know, murderous young thugs and was still willing to say that, uh, you know, speaks to how um, strongly he felt about his convictions. And, and there's a character in the book that helps out Alex after he's been conditioned that is kind of, so maybe that character kind of mirrors um, Burgess's experience that he felt, even though he had been, he'd actually been the victim of Alex's crimes, and yet now he was, he was right. trying to help him out, and he had that same... Uh, moral point of view that you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I'm not sure that people properly appreciate that role without that extra chapter, you know, that really uh -huh. changes the focus from just the technology, so to speak, to the greater philosophical questions. The greater picture and the greater philosophical question was much more what Burgess was trying to get at. The behavior modification is almost an afterthought. I mean, it could have just as easily been some sort of drug treatment. It could have just as easily been mm -hmm. any other kind of treatment that, in Burgess's mind, would have taken away the freedom of choice of Alex, um, and it would have worked just as well. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, I mean, anyone who's truly studied behavior analysis knows that that classical conditioning couldn't possibly be effective. And even if it was effective, which, again, I can't imagine how it could be. Mm -hmm. There's no way that that kind of conditioning could actually last, whether it be through a systematic desensitization uh, procedure or more likely through a flooding procedure. Alex would have been overwhelmed in terms of anything from cartoon violence through professional wrestlings, yeah. uh, staged and choreographed violence through professional football or people whacking into each other or rugby or whatever or just arguments on the street any kind of conditioning like that would just again you have to flood out before all was said and done so the technology itself you know or the behavior change technique itself was you know certainly not going to be effective in real life but again that's not the point mm -hmm. Burgess wasn't so concerned about whether the behavior modification would be effective um, anything that would take away Alex's freedom of choice is really the uh, the crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read that twenty first chapter last night, and it, it really changes the whole tone of it. He he kind of talks about he, he talks about what it would be like when he has a son, and then he'll you know the shoe will be on the other foot, and he'll have to deal with uh, the, that. Uh, he does a comparison of like uh, some of these young men of like a a wind up toy that uh, is so full of energy and then it's just out bumping into things until it finally starts to unwind. Uh, it was just the way that it was written. I thought it was a really meaningful last chapter. Yeah, that, again, it's, it's, and it's funny to hear Burgess talk about it. In the version of a Bach Orange that I initially read, there was a forward that he wrote to um, go with this newly complete version of the United States. And... Uh, you know, it's one of those things where he was clearly still smarting about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know if this was a really anti-American kind of statement or if it was just him being sick of the whole thing. 
but there was a line in that forward, point oh 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 oh, and he put several zeros there. One percent of the American population that actually cares about such things. You can eat this Swedish segment or spit it out. The choice is yours, which <laughs> yeah. I think was uh, again a throwback to the idea about you know, free will that you can either uh, enjoy this 21st chapter and you know uh, uh, take its meaning from it or not. Um, mm-hmm. But it also makes reference, if I remember correctly, in that forward to um, uh, Stanley Kubrick and the people who made the movie, and he refers to it as a misdemeanor <laughs> that they left out that 21st chapter. And, yeah. Uh, you know, decided to end with the I was cured all right and the image that he's just going back to the ultraviolence. Speaking of uh, then Burgess's view on free will, is there a, does behavior analysis accept an idea of free will? In the classic Skinnerian um, and classic behavior and analytic approach, behavior is considered to be determined, behavior is considered to be lawful. However, within that lawfulness, there is a choice-making literature, Mm -hmm. uh, there is a creativity literature, there is a great deal of uh, concept formation, there's a lot of room for the concepts that more, I hesitate to use the term humanist because this is a, a podcast for another time, so to speak, the concept of humanism, the philosophy of humanism, I've written in some of my work is actually a lot more compatible with behavior analysis than people realize. Mm -hmm. People make a distinction between humanism and behaviorism, and in fact, they're fairly um, compatible. The confusion comes about because third force psychologists, and I prefer to use that term third force for people like Hall Rogers or Abraham Maslow or company, they use the term humanistic psychology or humanistic psychotherapy um, because they like some of the ideas. But if we go back to the original philosophical concept of humanism, the original philosophy, which goes back centuries, it was a scientific approach to human behavior, and it accepted a, uh, that humanity needed to be studied the same way that everything else is studied. So we would still be there in the realm of determinism. However, I find this to be a, an argument that leads to sort of dead ends. As long as people accept some degree of humanism, or excuse me, some degree of determinism, the idea that behavior is influenced by prior conditions and influenced by our conditioning history, then even if someone wants to leave some wiggle room for free will, if that makes them feel happy, I don't find it necessary to argue with them about it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, again, the classic behavior analytic idea of behavior is that it is determined, but again, there is so much research that's gone into things like choice making and creativity and concept formation, just to name the three things I mentioned earlier, that leaves a lot of room for if somebody wants to try to say the concept of free will for philosophical purposes, okay, fine. It's probably not a useful conversation to have. It would, you know, it's really, we're getting into a matter of degree in mm-hmm. terms of how much behavior is determined. Obviously, behavior is determined to a large degree, or the studies of behavior wouldn't work. You know, they wouldn't make sense. We wouldn't see behavior changing in keeping with the environmental conditions that are created in experiments. Do you want to call that 100% determinism? Do you want to have some small percentage and leave open some wiggle room for some kind of freedom, some sort of quantum mechanical argument for Uh statistics? Ah, It's fine with me. I I don't Uh see it as a necessary argument to have to accept 100% determinism. Could our, could our free will be in part uh, our choice to arrange our environment in such a way to get more positive behavior down the road? Could, that, could free will be conceptualized in that way? Sure, and that's where the self-management literature can come in. I mean, B.S. Skinner was writing about self-reinforcement, he was calling it, as opposed to self-management, even back in Science and Human Behavior from 1953. There's a whole chapter on self-reinforcement and self-management and people organizing contingencies to bring about behavior change in themselves. This was before, long before a lot of the clinical applications of self-management research, and that's where a lot of my uh, own early clinical research in the mid-90s into the 2000s, uh, I did a lot of work with people diagnosed on the autism spectrum, teaching them to self-manage any number of behaviors And sure, we could put that under the heading of let's arrange contingencies to make particular behaviors of our own more likely. Uh, So sure, why not? Mm -hmm. 
uh, our people, you think people are are turned off by, and it goes to some of Burgess's ideas, they're turned off by behavior analysis because they think that it is antithetical to the concept of free will. And that's kind of a little bit anxiety-provoking to people. Yes, I forget the exact quote. I couldn't give it off to you to the top of my head. But there was Krishan Kumar, who was a philosopher, or I should say a literary critic of utopian literature, and he wrote a wonderful book uh, called Utopian Anti-Utopia. And in his analysis of Walden II, that's really what he came to. And uh, there's a wonderful quote in that book about uh, the fact that free will is the thing that people are desperately trying to hang on to as a concept, that if we take away that concept of free will, that's where people start getting offended. And if you read the reactions to Walden II and the reactions to Skinner himself, and I've included a number of quotations from these in some of the works over the years from, say, magazines like The Humanist. There was somebody named Floyd Matson who was very uh, anti-Skinner. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, again, it's always the idea of free will, and in particular what it seems to say about humanity. The way people are insulted, I don't know how else to put it, except to say that they're insulted and or threatened by the idea and unfortunately, people really haven't understood what Skinner meant by, say, a concept like control or determinism. Mm-hmm. They misinterpreted that somehow we're going to have a totalitarian or dictatorial government, when in fact that was the last thing Skinner wanted. In fact, when the original Humanist Manifesto, Volume 2, or the second edition of the Humanist Manifesto came out, there were philosophers like Sir Karl Popper, who refused to sign it because Skinner had already signed it, Mm -hmm. uh, and he was an enemy of freedom and democracy. Mm -hmm. And there were people like Anthony Flew and Sidney Hook, who were also humanistic philosophers, who even if they signed it, they expressed great trepidation with having their name on anything that Skinner's name was on. And again, it was this misconception that somehow Skinner did not believe in freedom and thought that freedom was a dangerous thing. And if you read reviews and articles about Skinner's book Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which I admit is not a title that's going to win you any friends or influence any people, but certainly a challenging title like that is going to make people think. And there were synopses for articles which had little headlines like, can we afford freedom? Skinner says we can't afford freedom. Uh Well, that makes it sound like you're taking away people's choices, like you're being a dictator and the choice exists, but you're not going to allow people to make choices. They completely misunderstood Skinner's argument of determinism about whether choice actually exists and how we consider choice from a behavioral framework. Mm-hmm. And and maybe another way to look at it is if you uh, if you set the right conditions in place and you have the right learning history and you can free people from the behavioral contingencies and the learning history that has trapped them is is you know it's a little more positive way to look at how environmental changes could help provide freedom for people, not take it away. Oh, absolutely. And that's an argument that I have tried to make repeatedly. Uh, And I was actually in sort of humanist leadership, Unitarian kind of seminary for a while and trying to discuss and organize this with people. I remember when we did our initial, um, I always joke about this, that initial go around the room and introduce yourself to people uh, what did you, you know, what do you do? And at the time, I was a graduate student in ABA, and, uh, you know, as I'm meeting my classmates and we're doing this thing around the circle, uh, I mentioned that I was a PhD student in behavior analysis, and you could actually see people scooch their chairs in either direction. Like, I always joke about this, that I said I was a PhD student in behavior analysis, but apparently what actually came out of my mouth was I throw babies into furnaces. Because, you know, that's like the reaction yeah. that people got, yeah. like Luca Brasi or something. And I was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the, you could actually like see thought bubbles above people's heads. What's somebody mm-hmm. who's interested in behavior analysis doing here at this humanist leadership? But again, it was a misunderstanding. And I tried to make the argument that, look, choice is based on your ability to do things. As mm-hmm. I talk about, say, my students the development of disabilities that I work with, or typically developing people for that matter. If I don't know how to do something, I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. I simply can't. Mm -hmm. But if somebody teaches me how to do something, now I have a choice. I can either do it or not. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have the skill, I don't have a choice. Applied behavior analysis being this very efficient system for teaching skills is going to be the most powerful thing for increasing autonomy. 
because mm-hmm. I'm going to teach you to have in, within your behavior repertoire skills that you did not have before. Now you have a choice. Now you can either engage in these behaviors that you've been taught to do or not. But if you uh, don't have the ability, if you've never been taught the skill, then you don't have the choice. End of story. Mm-hmm. And I hope that I... I hope I was effective in uh, helping some people to get to that concept, and that's what I've tried to really inculcate into a great deal of my writing and my work is that ABA, you know, again, I'm just echoing Skinner here, ABA is the best thing we have for increasing freedom, Mm -hmm. for teaching people skills so they have a choice. The last thing behavior analysis does is takes away anybody's freedom. It increases freedom because it's giving you skills you didn't have and therefore choices you didn't have. Yeah, uh, the skill to learn how to, to read, to read a, a written document, it gives people uh, incredible freedom that they w- otherwise would have to r- be dependent on so many other people for. Absolutely. I mean, you teach pivotal responses like that with a nod to the Kegels, uh, uh-huh. you know, uh, the ability to read, the ability to speak, the ability to interact, um, any of these things that you teach people to do. And now a whole new world has opened up, a whole world of freedom that would not have been otherwise. So instead of being like the uh, scientists were in a clockwork orange, uh, for example, behavior analysis, real behavior analysis to reduce crime and delinquency, what, what do you think it would look like? Well, actually, we have a really nice mm-hmm. model, and I'm going back to a book that was published, if I remember correctly, in 1971. So this is not something new. It was called A New Learning Environment, if I remember correctly. It referenced a facility for young people who had been offenders And it was a sort of an overarching token economy within the facility that gave reinforcers for appropriate behavior and was fairly well designed from a behavioral standpoint. Um, So it wasn't like you got your points or what have you for going to class. Anybody can go to class and draw balloon creatures. Mm -hmm. You got your points for mastering the skills. Mm -hmm. And there were any number of contingencies set up in that facility, which we can contrast with Alex's facility in the Clockwork Orange. And if I remember the data correctly, recidivism was less than Mm one-third when people graduated from a new learning environment as opposed to your standard facility that's set up for juvenile delinquency, or at least as it was seen in the 70s. That new learning environment, if we're going to be talking about correctional things, uh, you know, correctional efforts mm-hmm. would probably be um, what I would suggest. Um, you know, there's this sort of split thinking that we've never quite wrapped our heads around, in my opinion. What is prison supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Is prison supposed to punish or is prison supposed to rehabilitate? Because those really are two very different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we looking to make a situation that's going to be very unpleasant as a deterrent? Or are we looking to help people not to do it again? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can try to combine the two, but you know, I think we should be real clear on what the actual focus is. It, it is. Um, it is called uh, a correctional that, system, right? So again, I don't want to. You know, th- this is not my area, and I don't presume to. You know, be an expert. I worked in crime victim assistance early in my mm-hmm. career. I spent the first three years of my clinical work within New York City working with crime victims. Um, and certainly I'm, I'm, you know, I work a lot with the police. I do trainings for first responders and things like that, but I don't want to be pretend, you know, to have expertise that I don't. But as far as, you know, all of this goes, when I talk about how we can help young people not to engage in these kinds of behaviors, we need to, A, not have environments that encourage these kind of behaviors, which we certainly do. Yeah. And we have to teach skills to people that they don't have so that they have an alternative. Um, if I don't have alternative skills, if I don't have alternative um, choices, then, yeah, some of this criminal behavior is probably what I'm going to have to fall back on. Mm-hmm. I uh, skipped over the, the question that uh, I, I found out from the book. The meaning of that phrase, the clockwork orange. Are you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. So, so it's, I've read some things that Burgess wrote about it. Yes. So it's this uh, the the idea that you can't take a, a an orange like an o- organic thing and make it mechanical like clockwork. Is that basically right? Gr- 
Um, it, does does that say something about maybe Burgess's view on behavior analysis that we were trying to cram uh, organic, living, breathing things and just break them down to their component parts and make them mechanical? Yes, uh, and that whole idea of um, again just taking away the free will that 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 intangible element that is so important to the Catholic philosophy that Mm -hmm. uh, Burgess was writing about. Um, He, on a philosophical level, just couldn't see it. And if you read other books of um, Burgess, you can also see he was fairly insulted by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. There was a book of his called 1985, which, you know, Mm. take off on the book 1984, where he discussed these things philosophically. Uh, It wasn't part of a... um, a fictional narrative, and he not only goes at Skinner, but he goes at Ivan Pavlov. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wasn't real happy about any of it. If I remember correctly, again, I'm just pulling things out, uh, how like a dog is man, doing a takeoff on uh, on Hamlet there, mm-hmm. uh, instead of how like a god is man, it's like how like a dog is man. And then there was another book of his, The Clockwork Testament, and mm-hmm. another book of his, Wanting Seed. Uh, those were both fictional accounts where the behaviors again, kind of the whole idea of this deterministic kind of system is is vilified. And if I forget exactly which one it was in, but it may have been in one of his short stories. I'm thinking of Fable for Social Scientists, but I'm probably wrong in that regard because that short story was about people finding a vandalized plaque of Skinner, if I remember. But in one of the books, maybe it was a clockwork testament, there's a very thinly... Um, described, or very thinly disguised, I should say, B.F. Skinner, who shows up on, like, the Johnny Carson show ah. and is discussing philosophy uh, with Enderby, one of uh, one of Skinner's characters. And if I remember correctly, the character was named Man Ball of Glass or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, yeah, again, just sort of commenting on how ironic that it was in some of the, uh, the writings that Skinner's character was named Man, despite his... You know, ability to think of man, inability to think of man as anything except an abstract concept. Right. Yeah, it, it just again uh, hits people on an emotional level. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. Well, it, for me, it's when they, in the scene where they have the big demonstration and Alex is out there and they do kind of bad things to him just to see how he'll react. And I, I think it's the the priest or the the minister says, "But he's really not become a good person. You've just done these things." to keep him from doing bad. And then the the scientist, which I think is supposed to be like a B.F. Skinner type, says, oh, these are subtleties. He's cured. We've we've resolved this problem. And it was this kind of a, a cold tone about, well, we've just made this adjustment, we fixed it, and you don't really need to think anymore about uh, any kind of higher calling or morality. All that's been swept aside. It's just a, a mechanical fix that we've done. And and that that kind of it was uh, Burgess asking the question, "What is redemption? What is it for someone to change?" Yeah, the psychologists in the book come across as very anti-intellectual, for better, for lack of a better term. Uh-huh. Uh, they're really seen as very technician-like and very cold, even right down to Alex for all of his faults in terms of being, let's be honest, a murderous thug really appreciates classical music uh-huh. and there's uh, a very clear message that comes across the psychologists say well the music that we're putting over these images of violence seems to heighten the effect but i've never really been able to appreciate it much myself uh, uh they're you know they, they can't even appreciate beethoven they're so yeah. myopic in terms of tunnel vision that they can't uh even appreciate beethoven uh which i think was a none too subtle shot at the humanity of the psychologists that they yeah. couldn't even appreciate classical music, which this thug could. Yeah. Aguilar, who was one of the people, Gregory Aguilar, I believe his name was, who was one of the critics who wrote about A Clockwork Orange, he had a very powerful statement, something to the effect that in that demonstration you reference, with nothing else to do, Alex winds up licking the sole of um, the shoe of somebody who's attacking him. Mm-hmm. And um, the Aguilar, in writing about this, you know, makes the connection to Skinner very obvious, and he wrote something to the effect of, uh, if one was placed, looking to place a Skinnerian caption such as Beyond Freedom and Dignity or The Inclination to Behave, uh, one could 
could not find a better image than that of Alex licking the sole of the of his you know attacker's or antagonist's shoe. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact that Alex had been reduced to this sort of subhuman level and being completely defenseless and uh, what have you, you know, as far as Aguilar was concerned and maybe Burgess to some extent. Yeah, beyond freedom and dignity, here's a wonderful image for yeah. that. Uh, the inclination to behave, here's a wonderful image. Um, not only did they not agree with the behavioral approach, they found it morally offensive. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, when I speak with people about Skinner, sometimes they'll, they'll bring up that book, which was the first book I ever read from Skinner, which was uh, kind of got me on this path, was Beyond Freedom and Dignity, but they'll quote that title oh yeah beyond freedom to, to them it's a very aversive thing to a lot of people i have wondered about that myself i mean i have to be honest strategically speaking i don't know if that was just an attempt on the part of the publishers to um be controversial and maybe be eye-catching it doesn't strike me as one that was definitely sort of um mm-hmm. aimed to uh win friends and influence people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, just as uh, Burgess is sort of um, annoyed about what happened to his book, uh, the first book I ever published was a book which uh, was about behaviorism and humanism back in 1992. And uh, the title that was put on it, which was not mine, was The Reluctant Alliance. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking when the publishing company told me that, I was like, man, that sounds like a Star Trek novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I I guess you don't want to sell any of these. Yeah. Uh, I remember that uh, I had a whole new appreciation for Beyond Freedom and Dignity. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if that was Skinner's title. I would have to ask Julie Vargas. Maybe she would know. Uh-huh. or I don't know who would know. I've never actually looked it up, whether that was Skinner's title or whether the publishing company put it on. Maybe one of the listeners knows. But yeah. it, it always struck me as a very odd thing, unless you were deliberately attempting to be provocative. Yeah, Julie Vargas, who is B.F. Skinner's uh, daughter, who I've met at some of these conferences, and um, I suppose she's the one that people claim she was raised in a box or something like that. That's sometimes the criticism of Skinner, that he put his daughter in a box and, and raised her in there. Yes. Um, in, fa- in fact, there was a um, Brett DeNovi, who is a wonderful behavior analyst, uh, and Julie, if I'm not mistaken, have recently... Uh, revived efforts in something called the B.F. Skinner Institute. And if you look on uh, LinkedIn or Facebook for the B.F. Skinner Institute, I believe, they actually addressed that whole issue of, Mm -hmm. you know, whether uh, uh, Julie was raised in a box or exactly what that meant um, in terms of the uh, device that people saw the video. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, There's a whole interesting thing about that very explicitly. If you look in Facebook under the B.F. Skinner Institute, uh, again, you'll find some very interesting information. I believe that's uh, what where it was. I've seen it posted yeah, have to look on, it up. on Facebook. But I remember just seeing yeah. that very, very recently. Mm-hmm. I've seen it posted on some sites a couple of times since then. Can you think of any uh, movie ideas or story ideas that would put behavior analysis in a more positive way? light or more accurate viewing yes um it just it has to be properly appreciated that way you know i mean we've missed chances in the past something like the miracle work or the helen keller Mm -hmm. story yeah that really captures a lot of this for me helen was unable to engage in anything you know in terms of meaningful existence and you know, and, and I say that in the context of being able to interact with other people and being able to um, make her wants and thoughts and needs known. And uh, once she was taught the skill of communicating and interacting, there's that famous water fountain scene, the water pump scene, with the great insight that, you know, words could be translated from images. And, uh, you know, Annie Sullivan begins to teach Helen how to communicate, Mm -hmm. that to me is a much greater picture of behavior analysis. It wasn't explicitly identified as such, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. Uh, but something like that where we make images where people are learning skills and now having new choices and new abilities and the freedom to engage in the behaviors they want to engage in because someone took the time and trouble to use this science of behavior analysis 
to teach the necessary skills, mm-hmm. you know, that's the image that we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that really captures what behavior analysis actually is as opposed to the image that one would get from uh, Clockwork Orange, which is just such a distorted mm-hmm. and, quite frankly, inaccurate view. Mm-hmm. I, I think a really good one that came across to my mind the other day was uh, there is a, a program of uh, training these African rats to find landmines, uh, and they're called mm. hero rats. I've I've seen a, a speaker on it before, but it's I've there's actually been a couple of news stories on it. But they say science they they don't say behavior analysis. They say science is helping train the rats to go out and find uh, landmines. And apparently they also detect I think tuberculosis. They they have a couple different jobs that they do. But they they go through. I mean that would be really uh, especially nowadays people uh, are more inclined to like an international focus. And seeing behavior analysis being used, not in a cruel way, and then the you know they they don't the, the rats are not killed or anything. They go out and just detect where the landmines are, and then they're they're allowing people in these different regions of the world to be able to allow their kids to walk around without stepping into a, a landmine that's been in the ground for uh, however long. Well, that's certainly a nice positive thing. Uh, I think we can all get behind that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it'll have the public impact in the sense that people may still associate it with, you know, well, it's animal training, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, mices and mazes, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, But certainly anything that, you know, presents the science of behavior in Mm -hmm. a more positive light, certainly we'll want to follow Skinner and have it be all positive Mm reinforcement-based and, uh, you know, keeping any kind of aversive conditioning, you know, out of it uh, unless absolutely necessary and, and something, you know, which again shows the potential of, again, making it just a much better life for people and animals and everybody else through teaching skills. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So at this point, are you working on a, a, a another book or another project? I, I saw on the website that you, you're also a marathon runner. It sounded like you... Uh, uh, I don't know if you have time for anything else, but uh, uh, your next big project for you would be what? Well, I'm doing two things. As a matter of fact, in terms of the book projects, uh, there will be a Behavioral Detectives Volume 2, okay. which will be coming out. Uh, I'm writing with my colleagues at Proud Moments, an organization that I'm the executive director for clinical services. So some of my Proud Moments staff and I are putting together Behavioral Detectives Volume 2. And to be honest with you, and I haven't paid as much attention to it as I should for the last year or so, I have also been putting together outlines and ideas for another Skinner humanism book, which I hope will make, you know, the the points that we've been talking about today in as coherent and hopefully as convincing a uh, fashion as possible. You think it'll freak anybody out if you have both Skinner and humanism in the same title? I don't think it freaks anybody out because I don't think anybody is overly concerned about it in that Mm -hmm. sense anymore. But I think, unfortunately, so many people are so set in their ways that it's those kind of things that hopefully I can maybe convince some students, you know, who haven't formed their serious opinions yet. But uh, I would imagine that many behavior analysts will say, yeah, I kind of knew that. And people who are not too happy with Skinner would say, yeah, I don't believe the argument. It's too many mental gymnastics trying to, you know, squeeze the proverbial square peg into a round hole. But hopefully if we can get people to read it, hopefully they'll be convinced by the line of argument. For a, a, a group of people that rely on positive reinforcement and um, developing new skills, does it surprise you behavior analysis as a field hasn't been able to project uh, a very good image of itself to a larger audience than it has. Yes, that is something I have been very surprised about, and it's something I mean, I've mean i tried to work on myself. Some people who know me or know my writings or my speaking know that I have a sort of a comedic stage mm-hmm. persona, the Dark Overlord of ABA, which was created to make fun of this mm-hmm. and to try to make behavior analysis as approachable as possible. After that first book, I decided that my own skills are much better 
as a popularizer. Mm-hmm. And I always had sort of, since I was a kid uh, working in the field, the idea that I could be sort of a Carl Sagan or a Stephen Jay Gould for behavior analysis. Um, it hasn't, I don't know that I've been as effective as I could be, but there's a lot of people who've come up after me who um, have been very effective. And I think being able to put out a really nice image of behavior analysis I think we sometimes get in our own way, Mm -hmm. and I've made this argument that sometimes some of the ethical stances that we have, and I understand we want to avoid dual relationships, but I can't tell you how often I've gotten complaints from parents that someone refused a cup of tea in the home or something culturally speaking that was very insulting. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to them, hey, I'm just following the Mm -hmm. ethics guidelines that say we can't accept gifts. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favors by portraying this very cold, you know, objective kind of persona. That's not the deal here. Let's get excited. I mean, go watch Pat Fryman talk about things. Watch Brett DeNovi talk about things. Watch Greg Hanley, uh, any number of people that I can rattle off the top of my head who are wonderful communicators and really can get people excited about behavior analysis. I mean, twice a year I uh, run a team ABA. We run the marathon down in Nashville, uh, the Country Music Marathon, to raise money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Mm-hmm. And uh, every February we do a polar bear from in my town of Long Beach to raise money for Make-A-Wish. And I make sure that it's always called Team ABA. So mm-hmm. people know, hey, what's ABA? And, you know, explain that to them. And here are some nice people who work in this field who are doing some crazy things to try to raise some money for some kids. Mm-hmm. We're nice people, and I don't think we've been a very we've done a very good job of showing just how nice we are and just how much mm-hmm. what we do increases people's autonomy, increases people's freedom, and just really uh, we've been I think concerned with the wrong things. Mm-hmm. And you know, again, I, I've made no secret of the fact that I think we have shot ourselves in the proverbial foot by not always having the most positive image out there. You know, I've watched Greg Hanley speak recently. He talks a lot about televisability. Mm-hmm. You know, our procedures, you know, they're wonderful procedures, and let's make sure they're out there, and let's make sure they look as humanist as they should look, and let's make sure that you know, we're portraying everything in a way that we should be portraying it, a way that we can get behind, and a way that everybody sees, yeah, this is a, a valuable procedure that we want everyone to see exactly how it's done and see that we're really achieving some nice things in the world in a very pleasant fashion and making sure that we're working in that way and making sure that people see it. So I, I think there are some, you know, good movements in that direction, but you're right. I think for a long time we have unfortunately really not been as effective as we could be at showing the fact that, yeah, we are nice people and we're doing nice things. Mm-hmm. And some of us even appreciate classical music. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and I happen to count myself among oh, that, right. uh, whether we're talking about Beethoven's Ninth or if we're talking about Johnny Cash, I'll consider them both uh, classic. Criminal Behaviorology. Check us out on podomatic.com or anchor.fm. Please send questions, comments, and requests for transcripts to criminalbehaviorology at gmail.com.